My show is called The Spirit. It was first I called it The Spirit of the Woodstock Nation. And I brought on someone from every band that played at Woodstock. And then one night I just said out of nowhere, I just said, um, and my friend Pat Scully was here with me. I said, you know what? Unknown bands are better than what's on radio. Radio is such payoff. And, it, and, it, and it's, there's so much corruption in the music industry that the record companies, when I, when I ran record companies, you had to be a hit writer, you had to be a hit artist, you had to be a, a hit producer. And I did all three of them. So when I ran Capitol, when I ran whatever, Mercury, whatever label I ran, I, I was a music person. Now the people that are making the decisions on what's coming out are accountants and lawyers. And, and that's who picks the acts. When it comes to radio, with, with, big, with the big syndicates like Clear Channel and like Citadel, uh, you can't get on radio unless you're a big company and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, so what I did with the show is I started to play unknown <coughs> bands or bands on independent bands. And oddly enough, the show took off to the point where in the last, in the last two months, we wound up getting 30,000 hits from Beijing and 5,000 hits from Hong Kong. And now that for the first time, Tokyo came in. And it's been all, it's in 101 countries now, 18 million hits. And it's all because of, of young bands having a chance. <coughs> now, you want to know about Woodstock? What do you want to know about Woodstock? Uh, I'm going to start when you were a writer. You had an amazing writing career. Well, it's fun. Well, I, my first record came out when I was 16. Um, I was an old state symphony trumpet player. I, I played first chair. I, I went to New York on a high speed democracy concert. I was always able to communicate. My folks moved a lot. I went to 16 schools. So I had to learn how to get know people real quick. And I think that's what gave me the ability to write. And I wound up writing about 34 songs that made the top 100, about 15 that made the top 50, and, and, and about four that made the top 10, and a couple of them number one. But uh, writing, uh, I was very lucky. I, 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 I did a record at 16. I didn't even know it came out. And then I found out it came out. And my name was Jess Wild. I take my name to Jess Wild, W-Y-L-D-E. And, uh, and uh, I ran the youth group, so I booked myself every week to play. <laughs> before that, I was playing jazz. I was, I was actually in the morning playing jazz at once. You know, in the jazz and the jazz trio. Um, and I was lucky because I got signed to Evan, Evan's Kirsten Music in Screen Gems. That's like going to Oxford. I mean, if you were, if you were with Donnie Kirshner and you were at Screen Gems writer, you were with Carol King, Jerry Hoffman, and Barry Mann, and Cynthia Wilde, and Neil Sakakter, and Brian Wilson, who I wrote with, and Jan Perry. And it, was, it was like a candy shop. I mean, it was like going to school. And what a great school to go to. Within the first, what happened was I met Jan from Jan and Dean, they saw us in peace. To tie out with them, they with music. When Jan was Jan and Dean and doing Surf City and all that stuff, he was the number one student at UCLA Medical School. He was sending in his papers from the world. That's how brilliant Jan was. The, when I wrote, the, the fact that Dead Man's Curve came true, if any of you know the story of the song that Brian and I wrote, it, it was a song, it was a song about, and Brian Wilson and I from the Beach Boys on that. He, he wrote here in Ohio, so they gave him like a 60cc under. And I'm writing with Brian in Santa Monica, and it's all sand on the ground. I said, Brian, you gotta slow down. <laughs> and he, he speeds it up and we go over and the bike breaks in half. And we were about um, half a mile from where his future mother-in-law was. <laughs> and we go carry half the bike and he's bleeding like crazy and we walk in the door and there's the piece, uh, there's a piece of paper for some reason I just write dead man's skirt. I have no idea why. And everybody thinks it's about a car race, but I actually it was about it was about Robert Forrest poem, Two Roads in the Woods. And it was about the choices that you have to face every day in life, you know. And if you make the wrong choice, you blow it. Either you blow a relationship, or you blow a business deal, or you might lose your life. You know, you may make the wrong decision. You may take that one oxy that you don't want to take. You know. 
Anyway, when Jan had the accident, and Brian called me and said, oh, it came true. Because yeah. he thought I was nuts. I, I, he wrote Rolling Stone, oh, you were getting this for when, when Jan had the accident, when he ran his Corvette under an 18-wheeler, a 16-wheeler, and took the top of his brain off. Um, and then he, he did come back, you know, and uh, he was, he was uh, a vegetable for like 16 years. And I, and I saw him, I'm sober, I'm sober 32 years. And I'm a founder of CA, one of the founders of CA. Uh, that's cocaine anonymous. Uh, seemed to run the music business, folks. It just sort of came to it. Because you got and you have it real quick, and people come around you. And after Woodstock, forget it. It was so hard for my wife and I to just stay sober. Because everybody wanted to be first. You know, what was the way they used? Drugs. But, uh, my daughter Ovi was always went to private school. We always had nice houses to live in. Uh, and I worked real hard, you know, and that's why. Uh, Woodstock is um, Woodstock is now. This is Woodstock. This is really Woodstock. You you people that are in college now, you kids. Uh, well I'm, I'm I'm about as mature as a twelve year old, so <laughs> you're probably older than me. <coughs> but you really have the ball. I've been saying it for years, wait till that generation comes around and they're in college now. And, they, it's, and I said it's going to take four or five generations after the Woodstock Festival. It's going to take four or five decades till there's going to be a generation to come and straighten out the mess that the last four generations have made. You know? And it's really, you people have the ball. It's really, it's really, if you, if you, if you, if you stay on the road and you go right down 95, you know, you're going to wind up, you're going to wind up, you're making a change. And if you just make a change with yourself, you're making a change in the world. Uh, I'm no philosopher. I'm a, just a songwriter. <laughs> and, you know, whatever, whatever else. You want to know about Woodstock? You want to know about how it happened? Yes, we started the day Mike Lang walked in the office. Well, okay. okay. I, I'm, 20, I'm 23 and a half, and I've already written 32 charge songs, already run three record labels, and I'm only 23. And I was on a president of my college club, and I played this Boston baseball. I had already, I'd already done that. And then everybody knew because I was one student, I knew all the musicians. The door was always open to Capitol. You know, I took over Capitol. The door was always open to Florida's there. So my secretary says, um, there's somebody to see me, Michael Lang. Okay? And uh, I said, does he have an appointment? And she said, no. And uh, I said, well, set him up for tomorrow because I'm really tied up. i got to listen to these tapes. i got to go to the studio. And then she goes back and he says, well, tell him I'm from Bensonhurst. Well, Bensonhurst is the area of Brooklyn that I lived in when I was a kid. So I let him in, and it was immediate friendship, you know. It wasn't his story. I was sitting on the bed smoking ash and all that stuff. That's the truth. I was actually sitting in a suit. And he came in. I had Bert Summer, who was the director of hair, and my friends had already written hair, and they were the stars of hair. He was great old man, and he did hair. And, um, Michael came in, and his head shop had been busted in Florida, and he was broke. So for a year and a half, he stayed with me at Action on Summer Place, and he stayed with me at my house. And I sort of supported him. And um, one night, about three in the morning, we were smoking some good corn, and uh, <laughs> staring out the window, because I was on the 38th floor, and it was the highest building. And at that point, it was the highest, you know, residential building in New York see forever. And he says, you know, Art, you, you're really jaded. I said, what are you talking about, Michael? He said, you never go to concerts anymore. I said, well, Michael, I've been in this business now since I'm 16. You know, and I've seen concerts, and I, and I, I was on the Sunday and Cherry Guy You Babe tour. I played for over 10,000 people 22 times. I know what it's like. I've done it, Michael. I did have been right into So, So, uh, then I said, well, what if we took a Broadway theater, you know, and uh, I have money, you don't have money. 
Well, I'll use whatever I have. We're looking at and we'll make it free. And we'll you have a donation menu on the way out if people want to be money. And let's see how long we can make it go. And then Michael said, well, you know, I was in Florida and we tried to do uh, we tried to do a Miami Pop thing with Jimmy, but what happened was it rained and we had to call it off. The Miami Pop Festival, what happened was in Michael's and a millionaire liked the idea and two months later he put on a Miami Pop Festival and that, it ran for three days. But I liked the name festival and then we were talking about it and he said, well, then my wife out of nowhere said, to let my late wife, who had as much to do with creating Woodstock as Michael and I, said, well, what if you took it outside? And my head went, boing. <laughs> took it outside, huh? I said, Michael, what do you think? How many things we'd have if we took this thing outside? And we got all the acts we could. He said, 50,000 people. He said, Artie, what do you think? I said, well, maybe 100. And I said, well, what do you think? She said, over 300,000. Just like that. And I sort of looked off the terrace and you know, I could see forever. I could see all the way to the Warrior Airport. I was on 56 when I could see them to Queens and I could see the by State Building the other way. And uh, I actually sort of had a picture of this field, you know. And that's, that's why in the movie people say, boy, were you stoned? I was not stoned. I was just so blown away by what I saw in front of me that this actually really came true, that this was really happening. Of course, what was really going on, the movie was my baby, and I'll tell you how the movie happened if you want to know. I want to bring in uh, uh, Joel and John. Oh, Joel and John, okay, what happens is, so we talk about this, and I'm running capital, and Michael's staying with me, and once in a while he goes up to Woodstock to see his girlfriend who's living up there, and uh, a lawyer named Miles Lord, who we knew, said, you know, there's an ad in the New York Times that says, two guys, unlimited capital. And uh, we never read that. A lawyer told us, so what they wrote in the book is a lie. We never saw that ad. So I called them up and, you know, John Roberts was, was the heir to Bosch Pharmaceuticals, the sort of Johnson & Johnson, and he was a real gentleman. Joe Rosenman, who is Joe Rosenman. <laughs> and uh, we went to them with me. And they wrote in their book. Michael didn't say a word, but they respected me because I had money and I was I was running a big car company. So we made the deal for two hundred fifty thousand dollars to do a festival, and uh, that's how Joe and John came in. You know, and uh, and Woodstock. <coughs> no, well, we we put together Woodstock Ventures. I couldn't take my stock because if my, I had a five year contract and I was going to be the next president of Capital. I couldn't take I couldn't take my stock from Woodstock Ventures to get this. I would have been sued if I had a, I couldn't compete when you sign with a label, they make you sign a non-compete clause. And I couldn't compete against uh, with another entertainment thing against capital. Uh, silence is golden. <laughs> no, so what happened was Michael said Big artist, but you know I never done this. I gotta be away from John and Joel. He says, You know how to promote you and he said, right. he said, You handle the promotion, I'll handle I'll, I don't know, I never done it, but I'll handle the building and all that stuff. <coughs> he said, But I gotta have an office, you know, away from Joel and John, because if they watch over me, we'll never get this thing off the ground because I'm never gonna be able to come in with the budget. You know. Actually, he came in 600% over budget, <laughs> and we spent 2.4 million to do the festival instead of 250,000. But you know what? Every partner was needed. Like when, of all people, and they were friends of mine. The airplane and the dead were really good friends of mine. And uh, the airplane and the dead and and the who and I can't stand you now. So that was <laughs> his attitude to me. Uh, anyway, um, they they refused. They they said they couldn't go on. They wouldn't go on unless uh, they got cash. And it's a good thing we had John Robert's father because he got the Bank of Monticello to open on the weekend, on the Sunday, and, and give him the cash. I said to I said to my friend uh, Rock Scully, the manager of the day, I said. How did the day pull us up here when this could be a riot? Because at that point, 
You know, it is. I, I get to the rain and what the rain did. Okay, I couldn't believe these guys wanted the money. So that's where Joe and John. Joe was on the site twice. John was never there. Um, so those are the two guys who were running the cap. Now, Michael did hire the best he could find in the world. Chip Monk was the best lighting director. Bill Henry did the best sound. Um, and he had a staff of 1,600 people there. And where I appreciated what Michael did was really when the rain hit. Because when the rain hit is when the miracle happened. Because everybody was threatened. Now, we were threatened because we had people's lives in our hands at that point. If those towers went over and people were killed, you know, it was on us. I mean, I, I couldn't even live with myself. And it was a violent rain. It was, it was really a violent rain with like 40 mile an hour winds and, and the tarpaulins flying all over the place and the towers shaking and people on the towers and said, get off the towers, please. And it was really a violent rain. And then my friend Barry Melton from Country Joe and the Fish, he was, he was the fish in Country Joe and the Fish. And people don't know that he was one of the top, he was the top public defender in Joe County, California, the whole time he was in Country Joe and the Fish. So this, there was an outline, some of these musicians aside from just music. Uh, he started saying, no more rain. And people started chanting, no more rain, and the rain stopped. And then the mudslide took over. <laughs> because all of our friends are, what are you going to say to your friends? You can't come in out of the rain. So uh, the rain is when the miracle happened because the threat to everybody pulled everybody together as one. Like Ben Morrison said, everybody pulled as one as we sailed into the mystic. And that's what happened. We sailed into the mystic at that point. Everybody. And, and I, everybody on that field was as important as everybody backstage. They really were, and I really am not just saying that, I really believe that. Because when, when people ask me to produce Woodstock, I said, Woodstock produced Woodstock. Yeah. Woodstock was a miracle. Michael was an idiot to try to do Woodstock two and three. You can repeat a miracle. I never tried to do it. I never tried to make money off it. I, I, I've spoken a, a lot of times. I've only taken money twice from two huge universities. And uh, I've done so many. I, I decided I was going to keep Woodstock alive. So. I'm, I was very, Bruce Bowers is here, Bruce knows how powerful I was in rock radio. So what I did is, and, and I would, uh, when I had records, like, like records we worked on, like Crazy Trap, I would, I would tell them, like, oh, when I had Survivor, I took this unknown band, Survivor, and I took them all the way to Iowa Tiger. They were unknown when I signed them. And, 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 um, I would do interviews, and I'd give away a Woodstock poster, and I'd just do the interviews on Woodstock. And I did that for, for, almost, for almost 25 years, until now. Until I got my own show, and I got paid in the, the, the radio shows. Because I was really new that it had to go on in the, the next generation. And then, when the, what really when it went through the roof is when Time Magazine had a list of the 20 greatest accomplishments of mankind, and I'm not bragging about this because it blows my mind like it blows yours. It said number one was landing on the moon, and number two, it said the Woodstock Music and Art Fair, the greatest man-made peaceful event in the history of all mankind. And they had that as the number two. To me, he created the polio vaccine, and nobody even knows his name. And Jonas Salt saved how many millions of lives over all these years? You know, I thought he should have been on that list, and he wasn't. So, you know, that's what I thought. But, you know, I, I've been to India. You won't believe around the world what's happening because they're into rock. Like, they're like into headband rock to the rock of the 70s, you know, in the 80s. Like in India and in Korea and in Italy, you know that that's really where they're at. And they're just really getting into Woodstock. It's really crazy. 
They're preserving the freedom of countries around the world now about Woodstock. When I went to India, I did every show. I was on VH1 every night. I was, in, I was on the cover of the London Times. It was crazy. It was like, um, because it represents a hope, a, hope, a hope for freedom. You know, people say, what's your favorite part of a movie, right? They think I'm going to say Alvin William, or me with the flower in my hand, you know, which, you know, I, I'm proud of that scene because I really said told the truth. And uh, my favorite scene in the Woodstock movie is when I saw a guy take a bite out of a sandwich and pass it to the guy, girl next to him, who passed it to the guy next to her. And that's really what Woodstock was all about. That sandwich represented to me what Woodstock was about. <laughs> and um, something recently happened that, that reminded me of, of, of the same thing, uh, which slipped my mind right now. Tell something about the promotion. How that happened. Oh, the promotion site. Yeah, twice. you know what? It wasn't, honestly, and this is not to do my own. I knew how to promote, and it wasn't just word of mouth. I had I met with the Black Panthers, I met with the Weathermen, I, met, I had friends at SDS, I was friends with Abby Hoffman and Jerry Lieben, and I went all around the country and I made deals with every militant group that could cause trouble at Woodstock. And all they wanted was legal protection if they got busted, they wanted medical protection if they got hurt, and they wanted food if we ran out of food. That was it, including the Black Panthers. And that was a scary meeting that first day. I was very scared. I was. Now my mother, my mother founded the Freedom Lines. If you, when, if you read my book, you'll see a letter from the Congress of Racial Equality, and it, and it says that every Afro-American owes Shirley Cornfield a debt of thanks because without her founding the Freedom Rides with Vernon Jordan. Integration would have been pushed back 20 years in America. Now, this was 12 years before Martin Luther King even came out. So, I'm very proud of my mother, Nancy Saunders, and peace. She's gone about a year and a half now. Uh, the Black Panthers did show up, you know, and uh, uh, it was really sort of crazy. I was, I was on, it was my call of duty. And we only had a line to separate backstage, and for some reason, no one out of the real count was, the last count was from helicopter, 532,000, including the outlying farms. On the field, 390,000, but in the woods and all around, 530,000. Nobody crossed that line, so the Black Panthers showed up with chains, and it was really scary. And, you know, it was scary. I was scared. You know, I was scared. Uh, but I was calm. Because the vibe there was so beautiful, you, you couldn't really be that scared. You know? and, uh, I said, what do you guys want? He said, no one's going to tell. I said, listen, guys, this is, look what's going on here. You got Sly Stone, you got, you got, it's in, look at the crowd, it's multicolored. This is what you, this is what you're fighting for. What do you want? He said, well, we don't want anybody telling us where we can park our bikes. We want to park our bikes over that line in the backstage area. So I said, you know what? Why don't you park your bikes in the backstage area? Because I'm not stopping you, that's for sure. <laughs> you know what? I never heard, I never heard one other thing. When it was all over, the bikes were gone, and there was no trouble with any black man at all. You know? Which is ridiculous, because at Altamont, they hired the Hells Angels. You know, and, and, so, and I knew that was going to happen, because they sent me tickets. Michael went, I refused to go. I knew it was going to happen. I am, I, I can heal, and I am clairvoyant, and that's a fact, it just really is. You were scared, you know, even though it gets so oh my God, what if something happens? Oh, I thought I'd be in jail for manslaughter. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wanted to go to the Bahamas, actually, uh, a few days before, I was really scared, of course I was. Because I, I knew it was coming, uh, the promotion, okay, I knew, I knew all the program directors were really used to. So I picked 50 guys who were friends of mine because I had a very limited budget. Because Michael was going through so much money, my budget kept shrinking and shrinking. So I, went, I, I wrote, I wrote every word in those ads were picked down, you know. And I went to all these cities and I made special deals with the program director. I, I gave him 100 bucks, which was a lot to them in, in '69 extra because they didn't make a lot. And uh, and I let them produce their own commercials, but I said, this is what you have to say. 
and and and, it, and for that I got I got I paid like one tenth of what a record company would pay for that time because I picked my slots. Like I even planned when the summer was coming, what time you would get to the beach, what time you put out your blanket, and what time you would turn on your radio. I actually thought that out. So I I hit I hit morning drive when people were going to work to get the older crowd. I afternoon drive. I hit the beach time about ten o'clock when I knew people would be listening to radios and. It, it, and I had a great staff. Danny Goldberg, who started, you know, you know about Air America, right? Air America was where Rachel Maddow started. It was, it was really freeform progressive radio. He was on the staff. Uh, Jane, Jane Friedman, who managed Michelle Schock, who's a great singer from Canada. Um, I had a great staff. And I had people that did my time buys. And then we ran out of money. And it was, it was my anniversary to my late wife was coming up. And it was May 31st, the anniversary, May, June, July, August. Three months before, all we had was sliced stone book, and I knew we were going under. You know, because Michael, for some reason, decides to build a site without getting a permit from Warkill, and we lose the site all broke. So I had X amount of dollars left. So I wanted to find out where do I spend this money? Because I don't really feel that, that, it's, that it's people living in communes and people living on the street that are coming to Woodstock. I think it's college kids that are coming. So I wrote an ad and I hired the ticket guy from, the, from Bill Graham, from the film one. And I, pressed, I printed up about 200,000 tickets. And I didn't expect to sell anything, but I said, let's put a coupon on there. And, and, and sell it for $18 tickets for three days. I just see what happens. Well, 100,000 people answered. And, and we took it, we cleared, after it cleared, uh, we had a million five. So that gave the money to, to take it at least to the point where, my, where Michael couldn't get the fences up, but at least we had, we had a site. You know. um, Believe me, I love, I, 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 after Woodstock 3, I didn't go to Michael for 10 years, because Woodstock is very precious to me and very pristine. And Woodstock 2 and 3, you know, he wanted me to do Woodstock 3, and I made to pay me 50 grand just to be there with him. You know, Woodstock 3 I couldn't take, so we didn't talk for 10 years. Now we're best friends, you know. I mean, we acknowledge that we're the best friend that each of us has. We share a secret. We say something that I can't explain to you that we share. That happens, like, that happens somewhere in the cosmos together, and with Linda. And, it's, and it keeps us uh, uh, probably his best friend, and he's probably my best friend. You know, no matter what our differences was. Uh, the, the, the only difference we had in trouble is when he met me, I had already happened. And he kept saying, I wish I could write songs and produce and this and that. And when he went back, when they went back to do Woodstock 2, and I heard about it, and they came to me and I said, I'm Jeff Pepsi-Cola and a record company, Polygram Records, and call it a Woodstock. It's everything that Woodstock was against. You can't do that. And when I went there, I saw why. I don't mind it, but Peter Gabriel's a friend of mine. So I was hanging with Peter Gabriel at the time. The sodas were ten seven dollars each. You couldn't bring your own tent. You had to buy it from Woodstock Ventures. They spent $75 million building the site. I went to India. I know what it's like. I mean, I set up a food bank in India just to feed 15,000 people in the streets by collecting you know, food from the restaurants and hotels at the end of the day and then packaging it and putting them out in the morning with an actor named Jackie Schroff. If you look them up, he's like the mall in Brando, Omedia. And I, I was just thinking, how did he spend 75000 And John Baldwin said to me, when he saw how much they were going to lose, they lost about one hundred twenty-five million dollars on that concert. John Roberts and I were sitting up because I was. They put me in the motel right next to Michael. I had the room right next to him, even though I wasn't involved. And I was sitting with John Roberts, may his soul rest in peace, who I really liked. He was a real gentleman, and uh, he said to me, "Arnie, but look at the infrastructure. Isn't it beautiful?" And I said, "John." Yeah, the infrastructure is really beautiful, but the bottom line is, this has nothing to do with Woodstock, it's a ripple. He said, you really think so? I said, yeah, you're selling Pepsi-Cola's for $7, 
people can't buy tent, have their own tents, they gotta buy it from one side ventures. It's everything that we were against, but you don't know because you were involved in that side. Or you were the first one. So uh, but you know what? It took all the more. Woodside would not have happened without all four partners. There's no way it would have happened. No way at all. I'm going to talk about some of the acts that got booked and little John Sebastian story too. Well, yeah. I, I got to talk about all the acts. But, uh, because the movie was my baby, and the deal the acts had was they would get made a fee, and then they'd get half, if they were going to be shot by a camera, they'd get 50% more to be filmed. So I just sat there with a pad, and every act, you know, first I had to cool them out and tell them, <coughs> you can't do anything to incite anybody when you go on stage, you know. That's why you hear all of Guthrie saying, they just told me the New York Freeways, but if you look at the scene before, it's me and all of them walking over, and I just told them the New York Freeways books. But I, I just wrote out, how much you want to do this film? I just write out, we will pay you so and so be filmed, we will pay so and so to be filmed. And I had them all sign releases that I wrote up. They, they weren't even printed. I wrote up, you have the right to film us in a little bit of the final place if the movie comes out, you know. And everybody signed except Richie Havens. And Richie was a friend of mine we were both broke in 1962, you know, and he was worth making $15 a night to play. Um, Peter Townsend gave me a hard time when we were shoving match, but he did sign. You know, and uh, the funny thing is, if you notice in the movie, this is a secret, you notice Richie Havens, always, it's always looking up at him. Richie didn't sign, they want to be filmed. And Wiley's a great, obviously a great cinematographer. Each and director, each, but I'm talking about camera now. He shot Richie, he was standing right next to me. He shot him without looking through the lens from his waist up. That's why all the shots of Richie Havens are up his nose. <laughs> because he, he, she shot him without Richie knowing. I mean, I'm sure Richie's happy because he gave him 40 years of work before he died. You know. In fact, everybody in that movie, I don't think Country Joe would have lasted. I don't know if Santana would have happened. I don't know if any of those acts would have happened if that movie didn't play for 40 years. I mean, because they were friends of mine. And I, every act, had someone on my show, you know, and it's like um, Woodstock gave him 40 edit. And also, this was the point where AM was switching into FM. So that was the crossover point where rock radio really took off. Right, Moshe? Yeah. Around 69? Yeah, that was definitely a turning point. Yeah, that was a turning point where radio started to play rock. You know, and the, and the AM stations play pop. Now, I love the AM stations because my songs that I wrote were pop. We were doing a pop era. You know, when they went to the 70s, I was glad there were satellites because I still got love these. But um, it's, it's amazing how there wasn't one fist fight in three and a half days. Not one fist fight. Could you imagine if there was if there was a drinking crowd instead of a pot smoking crowd? <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you the truth. And as far as the drug rap, that was the press. <coughs> Don't forget, I did take Richard Nixon head on, and he was trying to stop it. There were there were people on the field that we had to watch that were planning to try to cause trouble, and we had trouble. You know, I mean, um, I got dosed at Woodstock. Me and my wife got those towards the end, the last night, and I had been taking this like that. And I asked Ozzy of all people, I asked the Dead's Road manager who had a reputation for taking ass, and I asked him, do you have a diet bill or something because I've been working three days and I'm going to fall over. And I got stuff to do. And I, I was, the band was playing, and I was sitting on Robbie Robinson's hand. And because uh, I could sit wherever I wanted to. <laughs> Stage. So, uh, and, and I'm hearing music, and it's so great, I never heard it so good. This music was incredible. <laughs> <laughs> this is fucking incredible. <laughs> <laughs> great music. It's incredible. All of a sudden, I see paratroopers dropping down, shooting people. I see the stage on fire. I see, I see hell and damnation. So, I, I, 
I say to Linda, we've got to get out of here. So we walk to the back, and we sit down. Michael comes over, and he, and he tries to talk me down. He says, Artie, if we both go, and you're going to get me tripped out now. He was talking. He says, I can't take it. I'm going to try to get you help. So I wound up, my wife and I went to the medical tent. They gave me some Thorazine. And uh, I came out of it. I was only out for about a half hour. And I heard, and I, I did, and I heard Jimmy, who was a friend of mine, because Jimmy and, and Buddy Miles, this is Jimmy Hendrix's belt that he gave me three weeks before he died. I've been working with him ever since. So, uh, and, uh, they were friends of mine. I heard Jimmy, they were just hit a cord, and that took me out of the medical tent. And that's when I met most of the guy with the, the towel over him and with the beard and the curly hair is me. Well, I'm sitting there, and that's a famous poster, you know. I, I have a shirt at home, he only made 70, and I got one of them. It's Jimmy, and it's just my knee right next to him. And he gave it to his friends, and he gave it one. I also have a bottle of Jimmy Hendrix's vodka, which people <laughs> ordered me for a thousand dollars for it. And that's one thing I kept, my Jimmy Hendrix's vodka bottle. And I don't drink, so it'll be there forever. Uh, what else? You want to talk about uh, Rich Sargis? Oh, you want to ask me about Sebastian? Right. Why is Sebastian? Oh, okay, so tell us okay. about the Rich Sargis here, because I want to talk to you about the cow cells. Because that is a huge... Well, that's a little, that's all in the story. I know, but we want to hear about you. Well, you right now we're into Woodstock. All right, we're Woodstock. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would go there after the car. Okay, Rich Sebastian. Oh, Sebastian, I don't know. Well, I have to love this movie, you know. The reason the love and spoonful went off the radio, the British came. And I was a captain. The British had the entire top ten. Right, well, they had, no. they had the top ten. There was no American bands happening. And I was working for Charles Koppelman, who just sold his, his chairman of the board ship back to Martha Stewart, who was chairman of the board of EMI. And Charlie discovered me. He was my mentor. He's the one who got me into capital. And he, he, Charlie, and we just reunited again on the phone. On Facebook, and on the phone again. Anyway, I had this wonderful. I was a director made off of the company. And John was there as my guest. And he was sitting with my wife, Linda, under a tall plane because we were drizzling. And he had dropped ass, my wife had it. And he had dropped ass, and he was John, I guess. And um, Timmy Hardin, who I reason to believe, was, was an artist in mine. So I said to Timmy, Timmy, can I borrow your guitar? He said, well, I said, because I'm going I'm to get John on the stage. He said, he won't do it. I said, yes, he will. So I walked over and I, I pulled the talk on the back. He said, John, you're on next. He said, what are you talking about? What do you mean I'm on next? I'm just coming on, man. I can't go out there. What are you, crazy? <laughs> and, and Sebastian's so mellow. I couldn't believe it. This is Sebastian freaking out. I actually pulled him out and gave him the guitar. I actually pushed him towards the stage. And that's why when he gets up there, you see in the movie, he forgot the words, because he was out of his fucking head. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, he, but he did, he did pull it together, and he sang Younger Generation. You know, from the beginning, he didn't remember the words. And it was, it was so precious to see it. And in fact, when Governor Fatak, he, he threw a dinner for me and Michael. It was a big thing at the museum, a Woodstock thing at the museum. And then he had a dinner for me and Michael at the Governor's Mansion. And Sebastian, and Melanie sang, and Melanie, I, Melanie, I, I got her a record deal. I knew Melanie for a long time. And uh, and then John was just there as a guest. He came with me and, and Michael. And uh, the governor said, John, why don't you sing for us? He said, No, I don't want to sing. I don't want to sing. And, and, and he said, They said, Come on, just just sing, um, just 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 sing anything. So he took Melanie's guitar and he played, um, and a young girl keeps going. And then, he's, and he stopped. And then the governor said, the governor's now sitting on the floor, and I'm sitting in the governor's chair on the side of the stage. And everybody else, he says, oh, do one more, John. And he said, well, what do you want to hear? And they all yell, welcome back, Cotter. And John just turns and looks right in my eyes and says, what do you want, honey? He said, magic. And I'll sing the last verse and chorus with you. And that's what happened. He sang, do you believe in magic? And, and, and I sang the last verse and chorus. So I, I love John Sebastian. He's one of the nicest human beings. He also gave me the first joint of my life. the <laughs> office. <laughs> I said, John, that's not good one. I think I want to try that. 
The next day I was getting half a pound. <laughs> And I do a perfect thing, it sounds just like the record. 
And now all the cow shows. Okay, now all of a sudden they hear and I hear a little beep, beep, and nothing else. One of the guys kicked the cord out that was a whole sound system. So for 20 seconds was total insanity in the control room. And I thought it was an hour. I thought the song was over. Finally someone noticed that the cord was out and then all of a sudden, it was only 20 seconds, it rained and it rained, I was falling and it came in full. The record jumped like 30 points the next week. It was almost like top 10. And, and I had turned down producing the monkeys. I turned them down. I produced David Jones before the monkeys. And I didn't want to do a, a, a bunch of actors simply pretending they're a band, so I turned it down. And then I didn't the money for that, but I turned it down anyway. And um, so it was sort of funny when the cow was not Adrian Believer out of number one. You know, it was sort of like a vindication. And what was it? What, what was that? The funny the point of that one that was really special. The rain. Oh, the rain is crazy. Okay, I finished the whole mix. It's incredible. Now I called. I called. You know, I I was at the record plant in New York, and you know the record plant is it, it's, it's a famous thing. You wouldn't believe the stuff that was right there. You know, right? You just won't believe all the stuff. You know, and uh, I have two hundred different rain samples, and I'm listening. And I can't find the rain. I want. I can't find the rain. So I said, I don't know, am I going to change the title, or what am I going to do about this? Uh, it was called I Love the Flower Girl up to this point, by the way. It wasn't called The Rain of Walking Other Things. And I'll tell you why it was changed. It was called I Love the Flower Girl. As they're wheeling, I said, send these tapes back. I take a look, I see one tape, and it says, Bacon Frying in a Pan. And I think to myself, because I'm a producer, I say, I wonder if we slow that down, make it in a pan, what would it sound like? It just might sound like rain. Now, we didn't have the equipment to slow stuff down. But there was a trick, and I'm going to tell you. If you took a mic stand and took the tape off and you took it around, it would slow down. It would slow down what you were doing. So I took the actually right onto the stereo, onto the mix. Because it was all mixed the record. I just didn't have the rain. And sure enough, there was the rain. Now, I blew the council's mind because they did a documentary. And they didn't know this, so when they came out, Johnny Calcer was playing with the Beach Boys, and I told them that I blew his mind. And then when the brothers, they, the family didn't know, when I told them it wasn't rain on their record, I freaked them out. I told them <laughs> that the whole, their whole life they were living on bacon front. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, if you're producing, you do anything, you know, you want to get that sound. I mean, when I went with the Beach Boys and stuff, I mean, we would make surfboards and hit them with bells and stuff like that. You want to get the sound nobody had. You know? uh, I, I, I always got great vocals. I always had great drum sounds. And it was like that. I always thought I would. I mean, I, I, I don't know what to tell you. Sometimes you listen to a kick drum, you listen for six hours. And, you, and a lot of people that don't know, you got to have, you got you to gotta tune the bass, the bass drum. You got to tune it so it's with the bass. The guitar, otherwise it's not going to sound right. So there's a lot of records out there that, that people, that these groups do, they don't know that you really be in tune. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, why it was called the rain in the park and other things is it was all called out of the flower girl. It's coming out in three days, and the president of MGM calls me over and he goes, his name is Warren Nasser, and he had a, and he had a hand that was like this, and. If, if you didn't flinch when you shook hands, you had a record deal and you would be You would have your way. And if you flinch, you wouldn't even go in and throw you out. Mort says to me, Artie, the Scott McKenzie record, if you're going to San Francisco, you know, wear flowers in your hair. He says, you can't call this, I love the flower girl, I need a title. And out of nowhere, I just said, oh, the rain in the park and other things. And I was joking. And they said, it's long, but I think that's great. They said, what are you kidding me? <laughs> it's very long, you know. I don't even know what it means. You know, honestly, I don't even know what the song means yet. You know, now, I, now when I want to bullshit, I tell them it was a prediction of my wife's death and my brother's death. It was a prediction of Woodstock, and I don't know if that's true at all. But, you know, I think about it and I listen to the song because I'm proud of the vocals and, 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 and the harmonies on that record. I sort of, Brian Wilson's a friend of mine, and Brian said, you know, you almost, you almost got, you almost caught me with good vibrations, and that was like, I couldn't believe he said that, you know, you know, 
Okay, so that was like one of the best compliments I ever had. He said, the homies you got were so incredible. So I had the councils, and then the father was an alcoholic. You know, the kids never got paid one penny in royalties, and they, and they, and they made $50 million. The father took all the money, and he went to Mexico. I set him up to be the council family, and that's how the Partridge family happened. And the father insisted that the mother replace Shirley Jones. They wanted to bring in Shirley Jones to play the mother. On the record, there was only the four boys. I didn't want Susan singing. I didn't want the mother singing. I wanted to build the poor kids as they grew up into another Beatles, because they had the voices to do it. And we had the writing ability to catch up. You know, because John told me the Pied Piper. Oh, well, that's another story. <coughs> well, that's in the book. Well, that's in the book, and I don't buy the book if you want. All right, buy it. <laughs> then, you can, then you can find out how John let it beat on my leg, and that's how he went. <laughs> and that's true. That's a true story. As Paul McCartney, I know when I pulled the bathing suit, I was swimming. 